are coming so far. Okay, and it looks like we are recording just as you as you're entering just want to let you know that I'll say that I'll do one more announcement. Okay, I think we're I think we're good. Good evening. I'm Sherry Rudolph. I'm Washington State PTA Advocacy Director. So happy to have you here. Um, we have a great night with Marie Sullivan. So I want to just get a little bit of business um, out of the way. Any questions that you may have for Marie will be in the Q&A. So we're not really going to use the chat tonight. Um, but we're, we're so happy. Trust us. We're so happy to see you. So um, and we know that you're um, we're here. You're taking time tonight to learn about advocacy. And so we're so excited to see you. Um, also, we are recording. So just uh, wanted to make sure that when we do um, do the Q&A and if there's for any reason um, we're allowed with the audio that you will be recorded. So without further ado, I will introduce you to our wonderful legislative consultant for Washington State PTA, Marie Sullivan. And good evening. Thank you, Sherry. Um, pleased to have everyone out there. It's so weird not to be able to see everyone. So uh, I'd much prefer if we were doing this uh, in a face-to-face -face or ledge assembly or annual conference or whatever. But um, <clears throat> what we're gonna do is I'm gonna try to give you a, a little bit of a glimpse into what we're gonna be looking at with the 2021 legislative session. We'll do a quick look back to see how did we do in 2020 uh, some tips about going forward. And I'm going to do some pausing at some different points and ask if there are questions. So as Sherry mentioned, if you have questions, go ahead and start, um, you know, typing those into chat. She'll keep an eyeball uh, on those things. And then we can, we can do some pauses if it's, um, it's like if something crops up and you think, oh, I really want to ask about that. I'd really rather that you don't have to wait until the very end to uh, to ask that question. So uh, anything general, leave it till the end. But if it's something that's uh, about something that I've just said, you know, feel free to, to put it in the Q&A. So let's go ahead and I'm going to share my screen and see if I can make this look pretty and work for you all. So our uh, discussion tonight is really about a focus on advocacy. And again, so pleased that you're here taking your, your evening with us uh, to talk a little bit. You'll see this smiling face. This was in the Capitol uh, last year when uh, PTA teamed up with PSE and leadership met with legislators. And it was a great day. Um, on our focus day. So we're hoping and we're looking forward to times when we can all get together and do that again. So let's look back at, at 2020, um, which really wasn't that long ago. But I think if you're like me, you're probably saying, wow, that was a really, really long time ago. But we had a two year platform that was adopted in the 2018 legislative session for the 2019 session. And then we had uh, a new update in the 2019 for the 2020. So what was in our top five? This didn't change. Social emotional learning, school construction and simple majority for bonds, preventing gun violence, strategies to address the teacher shortage, and then strategic investments in K-12 funding to close gaps. So th those were the top five that we had for a two-year platform, both in the 2019 and the 2020 biennium then are also supported were best practices for school meals, best practices for school recess, engaging families and student success, funding paraeducator training, increasing access to high quality preschool, and then raising the age for uh, tobacco and uh, vaping products to 21, and then safe school plans and emergency preparedness. So you'll see some similarities when we go to our 2020, um, uh, priorities. So how did we do last year? Short session, right? 60 day session. So really had quite a few successes. And I know that this presentation is going to be shared. So I've done some hyperlinking in here. 
so that when that goes out to you or is posted out to our PTA website, you'll be able to go out and click and see the different report cards and other types of documents. But, but again, how did we do? Well, social emotional learning, there was a bill that passed to make sure that those policies and procedures were in place in all our school districts. And, you know, boy, isn't that a, something that's really needed uh, for this, this particular school year. There was a bunch of stuff on the preventing guy, uh, gun violence front. So background checks for firearms, the extreme risk protection orders, uh, restrictions on weapons and daycares, uh, statewide office of firearms, lots and lots of work done. Um, but things that were undone or, or left undone and that things that we will be coming back around in 2020 to take another look at. Uh, creation of a family engagement framework work group. So Cherry Holmes is our Washington State PTA member, a representative on that. And I believe that last week, uh, Executive Director Andrew uh, Estep and Cherry uh, did a presentation on family engagement to the work group. So very active in that. And that is just one of the many, many work groups that PTA members are uh, representatives of our state organization on. School counselor funding was added, and I heard some positive things about that today. But uh, because of fiscal prudence, it was vetoed in April. In, by the governor who was looking for and saying, I think COVID's gonna have a negative economic impact on us. And so I can't allow something that's gonna have an ongoing or what they call bow wave um, impact on the revenues and the budget in future years. The same thing happened with paraeducator funding. We were very, very active on this, got the funding for the two additional days. But again, that was one of the things that was vetoed. Uh, $13.2 million in seismic stability for six, six school districts was in the capital budget. And this year, the OSPI has an additional budget request. And between OSPI and the Department of Natural Resources, they are really actively looking at how we can make sure that we are really taking that look at our schools that are at the highest risk and making sure that, that their buildings are safe and secure for our, um, for our students. Use suicide prevention ID cards. That's something that's been in, it was adopted and is actually, uh, if kids were in school and had ASB cards, you'd see that, but the information has already gone forward and been adopted. So there was a lot that we got accomplished in really 60 days. And then last October, you all were very active. Uh, first virtual legislative assembly, and I thought it was very well done. Staff and our um, PTA board and volunteers just really made this happen. Our position submitters, resolution supporters, everyone just pulled together to make this a really, really amazing event. And we ended up with a very strong platform. So you'll see some holdovers, things that we continue to value as an organization. Top five, increase access to nursing, mental health, social emotional learning staff, number one priority, number one vote getter. Number two, supporting students and preserving our education funding. You are gonna hear me talk a little bit later about what are the challenges that districts are having right now. It may seem simple to think that districts, if there's no student in a building, they're gonna save costs. Well, actually most districts say that it's costing them more money. And again, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, what about you? I'm guessing that you all know that there's a digital divide out there. And uh, so number three, increasing edu educational equity by closing that digital divide. Lots of work being done on this, both in the House and the Senate, at the federal level, at the state level. Lots of work groups convened over the interim. So we are working very hard on this particular issue. Uh, four, supports and funding for students with disabilities and their families. Clearly, we, we know and we've talked to legislators. You all may have been on some of those calls recently where, where legislators are saying they know they have not fully supported uh, the students with disabilities funding and that that needs to be upped. So uh, we will see, uh, I don't hold out a lot of hope 
for things that are new money, but I do hope that we can preserve money and that we can put some policies in place that really help our, our families um, and their students as we go through this continued kind of remote setting. And then number five, preventing and reducing gun violence and suicide. And you'll see the suicide is also a harken back to the number one about social emotional learning and mental health. And then three very strong, also supported um, priorities. So equitable access for highly capable students. Um, really important that we make sure that all of our students have, have access to the highest quality education they can have mitigating the adverse impacts of climate change. Um, you'll see a little bit further, but the house is prioritizing climate change. And so, wow, PTA is right front and center having that on the platform. And then again, uh, paramount to uh, safe school plans, emergency preparedness, and, and really being able to talk about why that is critical, not just in a pandemic, but at any time, right? So, where can you find these priorities? Uh, this is a, a snap of our advocacy web page. And again, I've got a hyperlink here so um, to, to take you in. But what you would see on the platform is the, the verbiage here. You'll see the top five. You can click and open these up and it and at a soon, we will have one pagers basically that dive deep into some of the data. We will also have videos, the videos that many of you might have seen during the caucuses um, and then also during the Ledge Assembly, those are being tweaked so that we can use those with legislators. We can share the, the messaging with other parents so that everybody can speak from the same frame of, of facts. So, um, so that's there. And then, we are working on a, another way to display the information with, uh, again, things like hyperlinks that would go into a resolution, go into the issue platform, so that we have an ability to make sure that people who want to do a deeper dive into our information are able to get the information that they need. So if they want the full resolution or they want the resolution and the position or you know, what it is that they need to be able to tell the story that that access will be there. So let me just pause there and ask Sherry if there are any questions about what I just covered. Um, and if not, we'll turn to the what's, a, what's coming up. So um, we do have a really good question. It's not so much the um, the actual content, but it is about um, the future of this um, class, this session. So the we do have a website that I believe did um, our comms department say this deck is going to live on our focus on advocacy page. I will show that later, Sherry. So it is coming to answer the question. And um, mm -hmm. so, that we don't know where this recording will live right now, but the what she is sharing right now, yes, that will live on um, a website that you would be able to link to for your for your PTA's use. Thanks. That's it. Yep. So far. Okay. All right. So far. Okay. Well, that's uh, let's look ahead then a little bit to twenty twenty one. So. Uh, we are walking into a what's called a long session. It's 105 days um, and that counts weekends. So it starts on January 11th and it runs consecutive 105 days, no holidays off. Um, and April 25th is the scheduled day that it should be ending this year. Legislators really only have one thing to do in an odd year session, and that is to adopt two year budgets for the operations, the capital or construction budget, and for the transportation budgets. And that's because the current 2019-21 budget expires June 30th of 2020. And so they have to put a new budget in place um, so that things can keep rolling. Next week, the governor will be coming out with his draft budget. And basically the governor 
cannot, he, he writes a budget, he submits it to the legislature, gives them an idea of things that he is prioritizing, uh, but ultimately the legislators will use parts of it as a blueprint, but they will also make choices on what are the priorities, what are the values that they have, and they will, um, they will pass that budget. There's a revenue forecast. There are a revenue forecast uh, typically every quarter. There was one in June. We'll talk about that in a minute. There was one in September, another one in November, and the next one will be out in March. So that will be really critical to see how is the economy responding? How is it recovering? Um, and, and, and legislators who are writing those budgets will then be saying, okay, we're gonna look at that revenue and we will really make more tweaks and, and fix our budget. In the, in the past, there have been special sessions, right? That have gone all the way up to June. And um, the hope is that actually they could finish their work by April 25th, but everyone knows that this is gonna be an unusual session. So we will, we will see how that runs. Um, Bills, any legislation that passed during this legislative session are typically effective 90 days after that April 25th date, um, not after when the governor signs it, unless they have a different clause. So they might have a, a clause that says effective immediately. I think we'll see several bills that are considered early action bills, bills that have to get done fast, potentially to give um, uh, some kind of predictability, maybe to our high school seniors. That might be an example of an early action bill. Um, transportation funding, we'll talk about it again in a minute, might be something they act on quickly again to give districts some, some kind of predictability and stability about funding. Because typically the budget would not be passed until the end of April, maybe the last day of the session. And then the governor has 20 days to sign it after that. And he does get weekends at that point. So uh, budgets again, typically signed around mid-May uh, if they adjourn on time. If they don't, they have to have it uh, passed and signed by June, 20, June 30th, 2021. So let's talk a little bit about legislative changes, uh, election results. So pretty minimal um, changes compared to where we were four years ago or even two years ago. Um, Governor Jay Inslee was reelected for a third term. He has given every indication that he plans to be governor and, uh, and remain there. Uh, Chris Rachel, who has been the superintendent of public instruction, was reelected for another four years. And uh, Chris, on the 30th of November, gave a presentation to House Education outlining his um, desires and his wishes for what's, uh, what he wants to see happen with the legislature. And he is among many that are saying, you know, if ever we were to transform the educational system, this is a good opportunity for us to be looking at what's working, what's not working, and be able to talk about those in a really frank and candid way. A lot of money was spent on the state legislative races, $41 million, uh, but no net gain in either the Senate or the House. So uh, House Democrats have a 57-41 majority and some Senate Democrats have a 28-21 majority. Uh, there were no changes right now in education or budget leadership from the Democrat side. Today, the Senate Republicans announced that the new leader uh, ranking Republican on the Senate Ways and Means Committee is going to be uh, Vancouver Republican Linda Wilson. And so uh, Senator Sharon Brown will remain assistant ranking. And then the capital budget Republicans uh, remain um, Senator David Frocht and on the Republican side, uh, Senator Jim Honeyford. Uh, Senator June Robinson from Everett was actually um, uh, appointed as a vice chair on the Senate Ways and Means Committee as well. And she is new to the Senate, but not new to the legislature and she played that vice chair role in the House Appropriations Committee. 
There is also a new Senate Republican leader, and that is Senator John Braun. Senator Braun is from the Chehalis Centralia area, and he most recently served as the re ranking Republican on the Senate uh, Ways and Means Committee. So uh, he is the new Republican leader. The new caucus chair over there is um, Senator Ann Rivers. Senate Democrats is Senator Bob Hasegawa. So a few changes in leadership, but, uh, but nothing that really changes or affects our ability, I think, for us to be good advocates this session. There are a lot of new faces though, because there were a lot of open seats. So you'll see there are people that we need to help acclimate uh, and, uh, and make aware of our issues. So seven new House Republicans, You'll see nine new House Democrats. There are four new House Senate Republicans and one new Senate Democrat. So uh, again, uh, some new changes, but in 2016, it was a much more serious sea change of legislators. So uh, I think it's, it's good that it isn't a bigger issue, particularly because they're gonna be looking at remote sessions. So uh, both chambers are going to go virtual. Uh, we've heard uh, even as recently as meetings today that they do not plan to have staff uh, in, uh, in Olympia. They, the legislative building and other buildings will be closed to the public. Uh, meetings with legislators will be virtual. Uh, they are still trying to figure out how that's going to work and what that looks like, but they will be very much like what we have done over the interim with Zoom and Teams and WebEx and, you know, those different platforms. Uh, House and Senate are both uh, discussing how many people they will have on the floor. Obviously, with the Senate, they need to have the president of the Senate, who is the lieutenant governor, will preside over the Senate. There will probably be a handful of caucus leaders and the floor leaders on the floor, but everyone else will be virtual. We are hearing some members might come in and just be in their office, um, but they're also talking about having 49 screens in the Senate and having those screens up at, at all times. The House is also looking at virtual and again, having a handful of, of people. They're saying it's, a, it's kind of a skeleton staff on the dais and a skeleton group of legislators that would be uh, there to keep the business uh, rolling, so to speak. Uh, they've been practicing, the Senate, House and Senate have been doing mock sessions to try to work out the bugs. And um, it, it's just gonna be very different because you know where I think many of you might have come down to Olympia, we send a note into a legislator into a committee meeting or onto the floor and they'd come out and meet with us. Well, that can't happen. Uh, they're either in a meeting or they're on the floor, uh, it, but they won't be popping out just for that quick five minute uh, discussion. So a lot of work this year is gonna be done via email using legislative assistance and also text. Um, so what else are we hearing? Limited number of bills and topics. So lawmakers are telling us that they will only get about 25% of normal. And that's a really small amount if you think that normal that gets across the finish line is 300 bills. So 25% of that is, is a significantly less you know, group of bills coming through. They're also saying in the House um, they've added, does it address climate change, global climate change and global crisis? But both the House and the Senate are saying, how does it affect COVID relief? Is it urgently needed? They really, if it, if it can wait till 2022 when they can all be back in person, they want to wait. Uh, will it result in revenue or help with the economic recovery or leverage federal funds? Committee chairs are being told to be very, very cautious about how many bills they actually here and how many bills they let out of their committees and that they really need to run through certain litmus tests. One of those is how will it advance racial equity and or anti-racism. And so you will see things in different committees in the public safety committee and the health committee, education committee. Um, the new, we learned last night on one of our calls with legislators that uh, the Early Learning and Human Services Committee is being renamed to the Committee on Children, Youth, and Families. 
And so um, we, will, we will be looking at things that really are, are focused on that racial equity piece. And then again, there's still a projected budget shortfall. Uh, so all of that, you know, we're, we've got the pandemic looming over us, a budget shortfall, and everyone trying to, to do the best they possibly can. So let's talk a little bit about the budget. Um, so in June, <laughs> the revenue forecast came out. So I guess, let me back up. The legislature left town on March 12th and the COVID pandemic was just, you know, it was just starting in the end of February. And the legislature looked at that and they said, you know, we better be thoughtful about this. And they basically said, let's take $200 million from the budget stabilization account and let's, um, let's put that in and have it for the governor to be able to use for, for pandemic. And, but they left the budget the way that they, that they thought. Uh, then, and, and, and it was projected at nine point you know, $02 billion shortfall for three years. So when the legislators came back in September to the revenue forecast, it was better. And then again, these are the November numbers. So I guess what I would point out is in November at the November 18th revenue forecast, the good news was up uh, $634 million for the current biennium and $328 million for the next biennium, but this is in comparison to June. <laughs> so uh, not from when they left town and not what their budget was predicated on. So here's a quick comparison. And I guess the easiest way to explain this is that when lawmakers built their 2020 supplemental budget, they anticipated that that budget would have $52.69 billion and that the next budget cycle would have 56.3 billion. And lawmakers have to budget not just for the two years that they're in, but, uh, but four years. So a budget that item that costs $100,000 in one fiscal year actually costs $200,000 for, for the biennium. And then it's $400,000 when you're doing the projected outlook. Um, so it's, they, it's not just as simple as saying it's a one-year thing. Unfortunately, they are planning far out. In September, you'll see, so the revenue forecast came in and it said, no, we're, we're less. We're 2.3 down basically for the 2019 and then 1.9 for, the, for this upcoming. And then again, the good news uh, for the November down only you know, a little under 1.7 uh, billion and uh, 1.65 in the, in the out year. So again, the, the forecast has been improving and, um, and we're hopeful that it continues to improve. I am hearing from budget writers that they do not anticipate making a lot of changes in the current fiscal year, the current biennium, but they are worried about what to do in this upcoming uh, biennium. So I don't want to get too wonky on you, but I do know that some of you appreciate a little bit deeper dive. So I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this, but I will tell you, um, Dave Johnson, who is a longtime staffer for House Appropriations, did a presentation on November 30th for the House Appropriations. That's the House budget staff and really tried to tell people what, what, is, um, what are they working with, so to speak. And so if you look up here, what are the budget drivers, right? So 93% of the, it's called near general fund and don't worry, that's super wonky, but here's the thing you need to say is that public school, so that's K-12 represents about 50.7% of the budget. So remember 52 billion, that means 26 billion of that goes to K-12 over two years. Then you have low income health and and there are things that drive that, like for public schools, enrollment drives and inflation is built in formulas. In uh, low income health, it's caseloads, how many people need uh, assistance. Uh, debt service, um, 
legislators used to say the first check they always write is to pay off the the capital budget, <laughs> which you know they've gone out for 30 year bonds, right? Then you also have children, youth and families, higher education, mostly discretionary, right? So the funds that, that fund our colleges and universities and our um, uh, in all levels really is mostly discretionary. Um, and they, what drives some of that enrollment, tuition, financial aid, corrections, and then you have developmentally disabled, long-term care. Um, so uh, these kinds of things, all of these things really drive what, what the budget writers have to think about. And then over here, it's what's constitutionally protected, right? So what things can they not do anything to? What things do they have to make sure are funded? K-12 basic ed, if it's in the basic ed box, it has to be funded. Debt service, again, we're paying off those 30 year bonds. Some pension contributions. Uh, you have to have a basic level of funding for your three branches, right, of government. There's institutional and foster care programs. And then again, anything that has been collectively bargained and is under contract is, is required to be spent with some exceptions and some ability to go back and renegotiate in certain situations. The thing about K-12 and basic education is that once the McCleary lawsuit was finished, um, once something was in the basic education box, and I'll show you that in a second, legislators needed an educational reason to remove funding. That's the most important part. However, if you go back to drivers, enrollment drives how much money goes out into that prototypical school funding model. And that is driven by how many students are in that school district. So there is a way to reduce K-12 basic ed and it's if the enrollment or if inflation changes, those are a couple of ways to do it. And you'll see here a few other pieces. So um, this, I know Andrew Estep told me this is too little and I appreciate that. So I tried to give you this other side of the box. So, um, so what's in and out of the basic ed box? And here are a couple of things. The prototypical school funding model, that's the thing that funds your teachers and your nurses and your social workers and your school counselors. Um, that is, represents 19.2 billion. Special education, as woefully underfunded as it is, it's 2.95 billion. Transportation, based on ridership mainly, uh, is 1.2 billion. Compensation adjustments, those are things like regionalization. So if you're in a district that gets a regionalization factor, of maybe 6% or 12% or even 18% above what, what the base level is for the state salary uh, for certificated instructors, um, that's an additional amount of money. Then we have kind of categorical programs where these are funds that have to be spent certain ways. So um, nearly 900 million in learning assistance, that's typically for students who are struggling to meet academic standard. Bilingual instruction is 41.2. Charter schools, just right under 100 million. Highly capable program is at 62 million. And then institutional education might be our students who are incarcerated or in some other form of institutional education at 32.3. So total, again, 26 billion, and that's this 2019-21 biennium. So what isn't in the basic ed box? So local effort assistance, which many of your districts receive, levy equalization represents 755 million. And that is the biggest unprotected part of K-12 funding. It is also some of the most flexible money and it's really used for districts where their dollar doesn't buy as much because their property values are lower. That's probably the easiest way to think about a dollar in one district is going to buy a lot more money than a dollar in another district. Education reform, and then you'll see grants and pass-throughs. Those are a, a mix of things, but, the, but they include things like national board bonuses, um, the assessment system, different things like that. 
Education agencies is OSPI, it's the State Board of Education, it's the Professional Educator Standards Board, it's those kind of education agencies, and then other. So, so you'll see between these two, again, a fairly significant amount of money. So what are the biggest challenges? Um, when I look ahead at this legislative session, local effort assistance is the biggest bucket that if I'm gonna make, if I'm a budget writer and I have to choose between certain things, local effort assistance is one of those unprotected uh, big K-12 buckets. Uh, transportation, even though transportation is within the basic education bucket, that means that the Supreme Court said yes, Pupil transportation is a basic education component and, um, and it should be constitutionally protected. It's based on ridership and primarily. And so if you're in a completely remote school district right now, no nope, kids aren't really riding your buses, but it's very possible that kids are having school brought to them so they might be getting their meals through buses. They're getting their USBs. They might be getting paper homework. They might be having home visits. There are a lot of ways school districts are using transportation and their buses, not necessarily to transport the same kids. And the other thing I guess I would suggest keep in mind is it costs the same amount to transport seven kids as it does 70 if you're running the same bus routes. So we are very hopeful that the legislature will take some early action on transportation. Um, but I know I've heard from several parents who are concerned because they are hearing from their districts about this and just know it, it is an issue. Declines in enrollment, fewer students really equals less apportionment. And so if you have a, we typically use a $10,000 number for a basic education student. So if you lose, you know, a hundred students, that's a significant amount of money at 10,000 a pop, you're losing a million dollars, right? So, so declines in enrollment can have significant impacts on our districts. And then really, you're probably hearing about this too, but costs to run or reopen schools in a pandemic. So connectivity leads the way, but there's a huge need for training, not just for teachers and paraeducators, but also for our um, for our families, right? For you all um, who may, you know, maybe you've figured out all those different learning platforms you're on, uh, but maybe you could also use some additional support. Not everybody has figured it out. Uh, PPE, big sanitizing. We're hearing a lot about substitutes anytime the districts that have people in uh, class in person right now, if they have to quarantine, their teachers have to quarantine and they're looking for substitutes and there's a, a huge shortage out there. And then additional staff. Um, I know one school district that hired 10 extra substitutes to go out and work in their childcare um, partner programs so that they could have that instructional element um, and the community-based partner could focus on the, um, on the childcare portion of it and the uh, substitute teacher could focus on the instructional component. Marie, we, we do have a little backlog of questions. If okay, well, let me you... stop right there then. Okay. Um, the first one's real quick. Um, is Superintendent Reichdahl's presentation available to listen to? Yes, it would be on the, it would be on the House Education, um, November 30th, TVW link. Uh, and we could, uh, Sherry, if you make a note, we can go try to find it and maybe, um, uh, maybe post that. Okay, and this question is from Heidi. She can help us out with that probably too. So from Heidi Bennett. Okay, and then Gwen is asking about um, the bottom line on the budget, how much money they need to find or cut when they start in January, and how much can wait until the next revenue forecast in March, or do they not need to do anything until March? Well, so so the numbers that I, I showed about the 1.6 billion, that's what is projected right now is the budget gap between what the revenues that they think are going to be collected by the end of June 30th, 2021, and what they need to spend. So right now they're running at a 1.6 
$1.5 billion deficit. Um, however, they do, they left town with uh, basically a billion in cash reserves. There's about 1.9, there's nearly 2 billion in the rainy day account. Um, and so, you know, so there are many people who think, and it depends if you, if you let, if you capture enrollment and you capture transportation, uh, right now you don't need to tap the rainy day fund. We're hoping they don't make those decisions. Um, I don't think there will be any budget decisions until it's all over, is basically what we're hearing. Um, if they do an early action bill on transportation, it will only be to tell districts what they could use, continue to use the money for out of like the governor's proclamation that's in existence now. And that would just give them predictability that the funding would continue the way it has been flowing. Okay, and then the um, Gwen has a second question. I will go ahead and go to the next people um, and we'll come back. So um, Paul is asking, why did the compensation adjustment double from year 2020 to year 2021? Why did the what? Compensation adjustment. Um, I don't, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure I said that. Hang on a second. Let me go back. Um, yeah, is, is he referring to which chart? This one? it was on the next page the one you just passed the this one adjustment yes it's over on the right oh oh i see okay um let me look um uh i'm i'm not sure i'm guessing it had to do with when the money flowed um, and potentially uh they base things on implicit price deflator so it may be that there was a bump in the IPD and that caused it to double. Good question. It's something I'm, I'm happy to go do a little research and look at. Okay. And then um, Salwa is asking, and maybe you're gonna address this later. What if any room is there for, legis is there for legislators to advocate for education priorities? What is there room for legislators to advocate? I guess so. What, yeah, if there's any room, what if any room is there? So I, I think that I think that we will have legislators advocating in these areas in particular, as well as things like school counselors, school nurses. I think that we will continue to see and hear about the need to, uh, to beef up, none of that will happen if there isn't new revenue. So again, the the way that the margins are looking, it's it's pretty tight. And I think legislators are just hoping a that the feds will come in with some additional uh, federal stimulus so it could take on this one down here, as well as reduce and blunt some of their other need to do cuts. Okay, and Nancy is asking um, for higher ed, Washington College Promise, how secure is the funding for this program? It's very secure. So uh, Washington College Promise is actually a dedicated funding stream out of the B&O taxes. B&O taxes are based on gross revenue. And so there might be a dip um, in the amount, but they, they won't be able to go in and swipe it easily. So I think that that is fairly, fairly protected. Okay, and from, we are getting some more. Um, Brenna, um, one of the issues at our school is the fact that we are beyond capacity recently adding portables. However, we have over 700 plus apartment units being built within our school zone. I've seen over the years what this has done to our school and I'm concerned, is there anything to do besides encouraging city council to revalue Zoom, 
zoning laws and continuing for our fight for simple majority bonds seems unlikely given the requirement for a constitutional amendment. So yes, good point. There have been bills in the past about uh, the simple majority for bonds and I understand there are a couple of legislators who will continue to bring that up because they, they, uh, they are concerned about it. I think um, not many cities charge impact fees on housing and um, nobody wants to drive up the cost of housing right now, but that is a, um, that is a way that you can help contribute uh, to, to school construction. And so they, they certainly aren't going to wipe out the need for bonds, but, um, but they're particularly on the east side of the state, there's only one city that charges any kind of an impact fee uh, related to housing. So that would be something that local, you could find out whether your local city does charge a impact fee for school um, use basically and, and see what that is. But again, I'm not advocating, <laughs> right now there's such a housing crisis, I'm not advocating for that, but, uh, but that is a tool in the toolbox for legislators to look at. Okay, and then Gwen's other question is that we keep saying that basic ed is protected, but if they don't fulfill that obligation, won't we just be back in the pre-McCleary position with the court imposing fines on the legislature that just aren't levied? In other words, is there a penalty to prevent them from cutting basic ed or just the promise? So, so they're not going to cut basic ed. So um, it, again, the only way they can, they can uh -huh. make a change to the funding is for an educational reason. However, you have funding formulas like transportation that are primarily based on ridership. And if the ridership is not happening, it's not considered a cut if the legislature says, wow, we're gonna take that money and we're gonna plug a hole somewhere over here. The way that, that school districts are funded is by student FTE. So if your school district is, is used to having 5,000 students and you are running 200, 200 students you know, fewer, um, the, the, the legislature wouldn't see that as a cut because the money is driven again by the enrollment. And so I, I think there is, a, there is an acknowledgement and an awareness that, that we're in the middle of a pandemic and some of these formulas, while they might have made sense in normal times, don't necessarily make sense um, in a pandemic. And transportation is just a great example. So um, I don't, uh, unless the legislature tries to go in and cut something, as long as it's formula driven um, or caseload driven, uh, there's no reason that the court would come back in and say, you're not fulfilling your obligation. Okay, we did get one more. Is there a significant more amount of funding for bilingual instruction for this year? No, there's, there's no, no new money for anything this year for K-12 per se. Now we'll see where the governor chooses to put, you know, when his budget comes out, we may see uh, additional money uh, put into certain buckets. Uh, but right now, um, I am not hearing from legislators, they are looking to add any money to K-12. I am hearing that they are looking for ways to keep the system as whole as possible. Okay, okay so okay. let's talk about, um, let's talk about preparing for session for you then. And thank you, Sherry, that was great. I'm glad we got some questions. Um, so here's just a couple of things that I'd suggest uh, as you as you think forward about getting ready to to look ahead with this uh, weird session is to really read the platform and look at our advocacy page and I'll, I'll go there in a minute too. Um, do your best to learn about the issues and you know again I said we'll have some one pagers that are issue submitters have done a, a wonderful job of developing with the research and the videos that will be very compelling and be able to, you'll be able to take those from the website and use those for your own meetings to share at PTA meetings, at meetings with legislators, at meetings with school board members. Um, so again, that was, uh, that was a really cool feature that I hope remains. Um, identify what really is 
personally important to you. And when I say that, think about the one or two issues that where you really have some energy uh, and, and you have some stories and there is a, um, an email, uh, either you can email Sherry or I think Sherry, there might even be an email about sharing stories that people can submit information to us so we can use that when we're talking with legislators. Um, connect, let us know if you are willing to testify. The, the one good thing, and that there are probably many good things about the way that school and the legislative session is unveiling itself right now, but one of those is that it is forcing everyone to think about remote testimony and the fact that that means that you will not have to make the trek from wherever you live to Olympia to, to go for a three minute or maybe a two minute or maybe a one minute piece of testimony. So um, I'm really looking forward to the option of having many parent voices uh, on our issues and being able to advance through, through that really true parent voice. And then knowing who your legislators are and who their legislative assistants are uh, truly going to be critical this year. And then signing up, and I'm going to go there next, but signing up for our PTA alerts, participate in the Focus on Advocacy Week, send emails to legislators. There's just, there's lots that you can do. So here's our advocacy page. Um, and you'll see if you, if you go out, it's in the focus area and you go out to advocacy, uh, learn about our priorities and take action page. So this is where you'll find the priorities that I showed you before. So they, they'd actually be here below as well as a hyperlink to resolutions, to principles. If you want to be you know, in the know and get information from me when I do my reports and when we need to activate you, uh, subscribe so that you, uh, you're, you're gonna get emails from us. Um, we will try not to bombard you with too many, but if you sign up here, then you will be, um, you will be in the know. The Focus on Advocacy page is a new one, thanks to our comm team. And it is actually found right now under the events and programs page. But it, um, and again, this presentation has the hyperlink to take you here. And it's got a little bit of information and look for it to have more and more and more information uh, as we add uh, speakers and more information about making appointments and in a virtual world. and kind of all of those things. The other thing is contact your legislators, right? Connecting with your legislators is going to be more important this session than ever. So if you don't know who your legislator is right now, or maybe they did have an election change, um, by again, going to this site on the PTA website and clicking find your legislator, uh, you'll be asked to enter your street address, your city, and your zip code, and it's going to pop up and tell you who those people are. And so then what you want to do is go out to their websites and sign up for their newsletters. And that's a way for you to stay connected and hear what, what they think is important. And it also will give you information about, uh, most of them will do a weekly um, newsletter. So it's, it's really helpful to know what they're watching and then see how you can uh, find something in common and link up. So a couple of session, a couple of tips for this session. Um, again, email is truly going to be the best way to reach your legislators this year. Um, I, I wish, I know that I've heard from a lot of legislators that are not looking forward to the um, to doing things remotely, but it, it is what it is, right? And, um, and so email will be a really good way to reach legislators. Keep it simple, um, one subject per email. So if you have an email that goes three pages long, odds are it will not be read um, or it will be difficult to act on. So keeping it to one subject per email, I wanna talk to you about this particular uh, preventing gun violence bill. I want to talk to you about this anonymous tip line. I want to talk about this, you know, 
each individual email can be about something. And then in the subject line, O is, if you know from my weekly reports what the bill number is, put the bill number in the subject line so that you have that ability. Um, always be respectful. I know that there will be a lot of frustration out there and we are just asking people to use lots of grace. Um, but being respectful in an email to your legislator is going to get you, um, it's gonna get you read and it's going to get a lot more, um, a lot more interest than something that just blasts them and, and uh, frankly tells them that they're, you know, calls them names or anything. So, so be careful of that. And then ask them for a response. Go ahead and say, I hope you will vote yes on this bill. Can you please share with me what your, position is. Um, and you might get back a form letter that says, you know, sorry, I haven't decided or whatever, but you might be surprised that again, you're going to uh, hear from them. And anytime you get information like that, please share with me, share with Sherry and, and we will use it as part of our advocacy too. So again, if you're interested in testifying, um, we don't know what those bills are gonna be yet. We don't know when the committees are gonna meet yet. Uh, there's a lot that's going to be decided over the next two weeks, but if you send an email to Sherry at the PTA Advocacy Director at Was State PTA, um, tell us your name, your, your city, what you're interested in particular, or if you have a special expertise that, you know, oftentimes we'll get asked by staff, hey, we need a parent that knows XYZ, and if we got you in a data bank, it's really easy for us to be able to make that connection. We might not get a lot of notice, um, but, uh, but if we do, we will always give you as much notice as we possibly can. But having that bank of people and interests will really help us to, again, sign up for your le legislators' e-newsletters. E if any of your legislators are holding teletown halls, um, and some might before session starts. Uh, it's a great opportunity to ask them, what's your priority? What are you gonna be working on this session? And then see where there's a link with the PTA platform and then build your pitch in advance. So this is, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm, maybe I shouldn't be, but that we will have kind of this pitch material out on our Focus on Advocacy webpage. And it's a really easy way for you to think about, okay, what's my, some people call it the elevator speech, right? But it's the, what's the issue? And, and again, if you're representing PTA, it's really keeping it within that, the top five and are also supported or anything that's in our resolutions or we have a newly adopted legislative principle. So things, things like that. Um, be able to be personal. What are, what are the things that um, you can bring? What is that parent voice? And then again, you're asked, what do you want them to do? So in 2021, again, we have, if you, if you go back and you think about that, um, that platform that we have, and then you look at the graphic of all of the different aspects, there is a lot. I mean, again, it, it's very exciting for me and I know for other members of the PTA Advocacy Committee when we're talking with legislators, they are jazzed and excited about our platform, but they're also saying, wow, this is a lot. And you do realize that this is going to be a tough session to move a whole bunch of stuff. So as you're thinking about what's important, ask yourself similar questions to what legislators are asking themselves. So is this urgent? Does it have to be addressed in this year? Or is it something where we want the bill put in, you know, introduced this year, but maybe it doesn't have to move this session. We just want people to start thinking about it. Um, how will it advance racial equity? Again, if we know that both the House and the Senate are, are looking at that as, as priorities, being able to think about what we're suggesting and how does it fit into that, into what they are prioritizing, it makes it easier for us to advance. How is it tied to COVID or current issues that are facing our students? And you are, you are the experts on what's going on, frankly, with your students right now. Does it cost new money? So that question about is there going to be new money and 
in a specific program? Probably not. It's going to be really tough to add significant amounts. Um, but if it'll leverage federal funds, uh, then maybe it has an opportunity. Is it one-time funding? So is it something that absolutely has to be addressed? Um, maybe that's something that they can do, again, with federal stimulus dollars that come in. Um, if it's an ongoing request, then again, remember, they have to build it not just one fiscal year or two fiscal years, but four fiscal years if they are looking at an ongoing program. And then always, 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 um, how does parent and student voice advance the issue, right? I mean, that is the unique thing that you bring to this conversation about advocacy. And, and legislators, honestly, as well as the governor and, and state agencies, OSBI, they want to know what parents think. And so um, being able to speak up and, and be vocal when we can, uh, very important this year. So again, uh, an example of something that um, I know that your executive director uh, asked me not to do, but I wanted to give you an example of a really well-written email, um, just so you could kind of see how this KISS principle worked. So here's an email to Senator Sharon Brown. So she's right here. Um, with a CC to another person who was on that particular uh, preventing gun violence platform, my email, your advocacy director's email, and then, you know, a, 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 here's what's going on. You know, I was a member, um, member of the group of parents who submitted a prevent and reduce gun violence to Washington State PTA Legislative Assembly. This issue was voted as a top five issue and includes this. There's a, there's the, what's the solution? A group of us would like to request a meeting with you to present an overview, discuss how we might gain broad support. Thank you in advance. Pretty short, simple, um, friendly, and got a response to, to say, definitely let's set up a meeting for next week. So, um, so again, thank you to Tanya for allowing me to use her as a guinea pig. And then Here's an example from Gwen uh, thanking a legislator who took the time to, to participate in an evening forum. And again, short, sweet, simple. You know, thank you for taking the time to meet with us. We know it's a busy time. We are excited. So here's the hook to hear about your commitment to gun violence prevention um, and the strong alignment of your other interests with our platform. Look forward to working with you and how we can advocate. Thank you for bringing up something new. Current platform again, happy holiday, best wishes, right? And then if you go down and look here again, um, referencing the Washington State PTA platform and including the hyperlink to the legislator. So just really um, wanted you to see it, it. It doesn't have to be super, um, uh, Super elaborate, I guess. Uh, Focus on Advocacy Week is starts uh, January 18th. And um, because we will not be doing a, a focus day in Olympia, we will do this focus week. And we wanted you to have the topics in advance to be thinking about, okay, is that a day that I can carve out where I can uh, try to meet with a legislator and talk about what we want to do? And we'll have much more information that will go with each of these for things that you can talk with your legislator, but just want you to see this. And then again, it will be on that focus on advocacy page. <coughs> and we're back to questions. I don't have any questions that have been typed in. So if anybody has a question, you can type it in. I think we have a little time, so I'm. Thank you so much for attending. Let's see. Yeah, we have people from all over. Very exciting. So yeah, we, this would be great. Then we can make this uh, an hour um, video that people can watch. Uh, let's see. Okay. 
Oh, here oh, we go. Thank you. People were madly <laughs> typing, I think. All right. So we have a couple now. Okay. I need some basic civics instruction. Where can I go to start educating myself? So the, um, so let me, let me see if I can do this real quick. So I, I know that um, Nancy Chamberlain, I believe is updating a presentation on kind of le legislative um, issues, but she, I don't, let me see if I can do this. Um, well, I'm just gonna say the, the easiest place to start is to go out to the ledge.wa.gov website and you will find information. Sherry, are you grabbing that? For some reason, my mouse seems to have died and I can't get off of. I just put it in there. Okay. Um, they have like a citizen's guide to working with the legislature, approaching the legislator. Um, there's a lot of good information there, as well as, again, if you look at that Washington State PTA site, um, the PTA site has a lot of good information um, there as well. So um, multiple, multiple places, as well as typically we do some training during annual conference um, about advocacy in general, not just with the state legislative process, but with your school boards. Um, and then we also usually would have time to do that kind of training at a legislative assembly. I'm hoping we'll be doing that again next year. Okay, sorry, I'm, I, I, I think you can find your own thing. If you just go to ledge.wa.gov, I was gonna do another link, but all right. Are you planning on doing the pre-written emails through the Action Network like we did last year? So that's a really great question. And I would say, so this was an interesting thing. We had a, um, a meeting last night with several legislators who are very strong proponents of PTA. And their advice was not to do kind of those big mass emails, um, but to, to, to do our best to get to know legislators so that they are looking for your name and they they know your name. So um, we will probably put together content, um, but it may not be, depending on the issue, it, it may be better for us to be very, very focused. And again, um, look for ways for the legislator to know your name so that when it pops out of the 1000 that they've got in the last 10 minutes, um, they, they read yours. So, uh, if you have any opportunities to introduce yourselves to legislators before January 11, really encourage you to do that. And, and um, so, yeah, but okay. we will have, con we will have content. We'll have, we'll have talking points and things like that, that people can use, but you may have to do a little bit more individual look so that we just heard that they're going to ignore a lot of stuff that looks like it's kind of canned. And that was good feedback for us. Okay, um, we have lots of thank yous. Um, Nancy shared another um, link that I can put in the chat, I believe. I have, yeah, I think I got the right one. So, put it in there. There we go. Okay, so this link that I just shared, um, Nancy, um, let us know that that's a good one for some handouts on the Legislative Information Center. Okay, um, do we have a source for understanding the various sources of education funding? So yes, so again, on that legislative website, there's, uh, I wanna say it's about 80 something pages long, but it's called a Citizen's Guide to K-12 Finance. And it, you know, it, it, it explains it as best you possibly can. I think Sherry and I have talked about creating some funding modules to explain K-12 funding. And that's probably something we will work on once session is over. Sorry that it won't be done beforehand, but we, we do know there's a, a need to really explain K-12 finance um, and, and 
help people understand where that money comes from. I, I guess I would say if you're trying to figure out you know, where the majority of the funding comes from, it, it really is property taxes come to the state and those are, that's the bulk of the, of the dollars now. Local levies are supposed to be for enrichment only and not buying things like basic ed. And then of course you have again, local effort assistance um, that is that levy equalization, which is state funding general fund, but it, it goes out to districts that, that need that additional assistance. And so um, again, to be kind of wonky, if a prototypical school model says that uh, it takes um, 6,000 students to generate one nurse, and I'm just making up a number, uh, and your school has 3,000 students, but you have a nurse and not a half-time nurse, might be half time funded by the state and they might use local effort assistance to fund that other half to make sure you've got a, a full time, so. Okay, I shared, um, Gwen and Nancy both replied almost within seconds of each other with the link for me. So there, that is also on the Was State PTA um, website as well, but I shared the one um, from the wa.ledge.gov. So that's in the chat. Thanks, Sherry. There, any other questions? All right. Okay, well, thank you so much again for being here tonight. We really do appreciate this. And again, if you have additional questions that come up later, please feel free to, to email us and we'll do our best to answer them in a, in a timely way. Um, but we hope this is good, good overall training. And we do have another one planned for January. Um, and so we will um, we'll do a little bit more deeper dive and we will have uh, hopefully some legislators on that one so that we are able to, um, we're able to get a real good look at, at the legislative session the week before it starts. Okay, that's January 5th. So yes, and night. same bat time, same bat channel. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. And we will um, we'll hopefully give some social media shouts out to when this is available for you to see online or on the yeah. website. All right. Thanks. Okay. Good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Appreciate you.